The Himalayas are home to the world's highest summit. This colossal chain, which extends over 2,400 kilometers, is bedecked with 15,000 glaciers. Multiple countries depend on these giants for their water supply and field irrigation. But these titans are not unchangeable. In the Andes, the Alps, and the Poles, our planet ice has lost up to 40% of its volume in the last 30 years alone. Entire villages are at times deprived of water, and gigantic glacial lakes threaten certain mountain populations. Given their high altitudes, the Himalayan glaciers are by far the least studied. Yet some scientists believe it is urgent to evaluate the impact of global warming on the planet's highest glaciers. A belief that forces scientists to carry out their research in extremely difficult conditions. Et demain, l'idée, on prend la trace de la voie normale du Mera, on fait une petite pause au camp haut, et ensuite on continue jusqu'à 6004, quasiment jusqu'au sommet. Et là, l'idée, c'est d'installer une station météo. Les alpinistes, ils ne restent pas au sommet, sinon pour prendre la photo, là, il va falloir rester plusieurs heures à travailler. Oh. Oh. Ce qu'on fait, c'est un peu surhumain. In Kathmandu, the Nepalese Arts Council is having an exhibition on global warming overseen by David Brashears, who has climbed Mount Everest on five separate occasions. I first climbed Everest in 1983. I've climbed it again in 2004. Parts of it seem to me to be a different mountain. Just thinning of the ice, thinning of the snow, and drier. Concerned about the glacier's future, this mountaineer developed a system for documenting certain parts of the Himalayan chain in ultra-high resolution, evidence which confirmed the transformation he had seen on the ground. For our eyes, which are quite trained, we know that this line is right here. This comparison, over barely a century, speaks volumes about the extent of the glaciers melting. You know, these are the most majestic mountains in the world and the highest. But right now, there's a tremendous amount of attention being focused finally on the Himalayan region in terms of uh, warming and climate change. For me, glaciers and snow and ice just um, so connected to these big mountains. Himalaya, abode of snows. Are the Himalayan glaciers disappearing? Fascinated by this very question, glaciologist Patrick Vagnon took up residence in Kathmandu in 2012 to get closer to an answer. Today, he'll fly to the Himalayan chain with his team from the Institute of Research for Development. Like every year since 2007, the team will embark on a mission of several weeks in grueling high altitude conditions. Il y a très peu de gens qui ont travaillé sur ces glaciers-là parce que c'est difficile d'accès. Donc on connaît peu de choses qui fait tout l'intérêt de venir travailler ici. Ces glaciers ils sont intéressants pour plusieurs raisons parce que déjà ils recouvrent des surfaces qui sont très importantes. Si on prend la chaîne himalayenne au sens large, c'est 70 000 km carrés de glaciers, c'est la plus large surface glaciaire à part le Groenland et l'Antarctique. Mais c'est un intérêt extrême ici parce qu'on est tout près des populations. Il y a l'Inde, la Chine, deux pays immenses juste à côté. Et la chaîne himalayenne est juste entre les deux et permet d'alimenter en eau un certain nombre de régions dans ces pays-là qui sont très densément peuplées. Donc comprendre comment ces glaciers fonctionnent, ça c'est vraiment intéressant pour les populations qui sont juste en dessous. First stop, the city of Lukla, a mandatory stopping point for those wishing to reach Mount Everest. At an elevation of 2,860 meters, this is a particularly dangerous airport. Only the most experienced pilots venture on its runway, tucked deep in the heart of this high mountain valley.
Bah ouais, t'as vu, on change de, de température là quand même. Mmh. Profitez-en ici, il fait chaud. <rire> The scientists have brought 400 kilograms of food and equipment. Accompanied by a small army of porters, an essential part of any Himalayan expedition, they will walk five days to reach the Mira Peak base camp, which culminates at an altitude of 6,500 meters. Tomorrow, they will climb to 4,500 meters. The short acclimatization time makes every step a challenge. Hey, C'est pas comme dans les Alpes, c'est pas comme dans les Andes. Les glaciers ici sont vraiment loin. Souvent, tu es obligé de faire plusieurs journées de marche. Donc, euh, comme les montagnes sont loin, sont difficiles d'accès, sont élevées. Du coup, c'est forcément en même temps qu'un défi scientifique, c'est forcément un défi sportif aussi. Il faut quand même être entraîné. Il faut aimer le milieu dans lequel on évolue. Je pense que c'est vraiment la, la donnée de base. Patrick Vagnon is not the only one fascinated by our planet's rooftop glaciers. Geographer Alton Byers is also undergoing a scientific expedition to the Imja Glacier in the northern part of the Kumbu Valley. 40 years ago today, I was walking this same street. I was 21 years old, an undergraduate at the University of Colorado. Came over to Nepal for six months, doing a couple of independent studies. And this place was very, very different. In the Everest region, the number of tourists has gone from a few dozen in 1970 to over 40,000 a year today, bringing with them an ever-growing number of porters and guides. Although these crowds have allowed a certain amount of economic development, they also present serious ecological problems. Now, this water used to be used for drinking, but now it's become contaminated from the septic tanks from the dozens of different lodges throughout Namche Bazaar, and it's only used for washing purposes today. Now, freshwater sources in general are disappearing throughout the Kumbu region as a result of irregular precipitation patterns brought on by climate change. The surrounding villages still rely on mountain water sources to meet their drinking water needs. Due to increased tourist pressure, the authorities are now turning to the glaciers. Glaciers, all of a sudden, are a better bet than are the traditional sources of springs, which are drying up everywhere. A few kilometers away, the Chiajo Glacier flows into a lake, the water of which will be transported down the mountainside through a pipeline that is being built at great cost. But this gives you an idea of the extreme measures that people are going to today, even in developing countries, to um, respond to the impacts of climate change. Are such investments made in vain, considering the potential threat that hovers over these glaciers? In the Himalayas, the variable flow of stream water has become an ever-growing problem for the hydroelectric stations that can no longer meet the local people's needs. In Kathmandu, daily service interruptions have put serious strain on the electrical grid. At least 90% of the country's electricity is water-powered from river sources. A significant amount of this water comes from the monsoon. The Himalayan chain is so colossal that it blocks these warm, humid winds coming from India. The summer sees the formation of gigantic clouds and intense rain batter the base of these mountains. At high altitudes near the summits, the resulting abundant snowfall helps to replenish the glaciers. How are these ice giants evolving? 
while being simultaneously subjected to monsoon rains and global warming in the Himalayan region. Such is the question that Patrick Vagnon's team seeks to answer. They have walked for two days from Lukla, descending to an altitude of 3,500 meters in the valley that leads to Mira Peak. In addition to the impact of global warming on glaciers, other questions are a matter of concern to glaciologist Christian Vincent. Il y a beaucoup de questions scientifiques qui m'intéressent dans l'Himalaya. Il y a beaucoup de risques d'origine glaciaire liés aux lacs proglaciaires, ces lacs qui sont à proximité des glaciers et qui risquent de provoquer des ruptures et des vidanges brutales. Là, on est dans l'Inku Valley. On est à peu près à mi-chemin dans la marge d'approche entre l'Ukla et le glacier du Mera. Et c'est une vallée un peu particulière parce qu'en 98, il y a le lac qui s'appelle Tsavaitso, juste au-dessus, au-dessus du village où on va arriver, qui a provoqué une lave torrentielle. On September 3, 1998, part of the Tangnag village was destroyed when the lake's moraine burst. On a très peu d'informations sur la rupture. On a une photo qui montre le début de la vidange. The disaster was immortalized by one of the rare witnesses who still lives on site. Early in the morning, big noise came, like an airplane, yeah. like a flood. Oh, then after we wake up, we look it up there, mm -hmm. up there, water coming like a cloud. Okay. Like cloud from the top. Don't blow us, my brothers. I call it them. Run up, run up, run up, cloud come. Have you seen some uh, block of ice after? After block ice, many ice came we seen. Yes, many you have ice seen came some in with a yeah. after landslide we went to see there there was big big ice. Okay. Big big ice in the lake. Ça semble confirmer que à l'origine, c'est une chute de Serac qui a provoqué la vidange euh, du lac et que ensuite c'est une vague qui a submergé la moraine. Climbing up over the scree, the scientists find themselves on the moraine that once held back the lake. Euh, le lac euh, à l'époque hein, avant la catastrophe, il devait être gigantesque. Hein. Ah, c'est assez incroyable hein, ce qu'on voit. Before the disaster, the water level reached a line one can still see on the facing slope. The brutal emptying of the lake lowered the water level by dozens of meters. Ces moraines, en fait, ce sont des tas de cailloux qui sont apportés par euh, le glacier. Et ensuite, lorsque le glacier recule, ça forme une vaste cuvette, là où l'eau va s'accumuler, le niveau d'eau augmente, et c'est là qu'il peut y avoir un danger. Ici, on voit les, les langues blanches. Là, c'est des dépôts de glace qui tombent régulièrement dans le lac. Donc, c'est un accident qui peut encore arriver, mais c'est vraiment un cas d'école pour expliquer ce qui peut se passer et malheureusement, ce qui se passe régulièrement en Himalaya. On that day, two people were killed in the valley. Over 40 glacial floods have taken place in the Himalayan chain since the 1930s. The main reason behind the scientific investigations of Lake Imja, a large lake found high above the Kumbu Valley, is to determine its risk of draining. In the Kumbu Valley, the risks associated with glacial melting are a constant preoccupation for Alton Byers as he approaches Lake Imja. So now we're up at about 4,400 meters in the land of the glaciers, which must be one of the most incredible landscapes in the world. Everything here has been carved by a glacier at some point in time. Glaciers in the Kumbu tend to be debris covered, 
and debris from the sides of the valleys tends to fall on the glaciers and you get a debris covered glacier. However, it does have a benefit if you have a thick layer of debris that tends to buffer the glacier against melting. But we're going up to another glacier, Imja, that has actually turned into a lake. And we're gonna go find out why. In the southeastern Himalayan chain and in the Andes, glacial lakes are expanding. In 1941 in Peru, flooding killed 6,000 people in the village of Huaraz. The authorities have since built a dam, but the lake continues to grow. If it were to burst again, this time up to 30,000 people could perish. Alton has brought a Nepalese team with him to Peru to study the solutions applied by local engineers. To lower the level of the lake, they dug a trench in the moraine and installed a drainage system to evacuate the water. Here, the moraine was made entirely of stone and robust enough to allow construction work to take place without the risk of rupture due to unplanned thawing. For the Nepalese, the key issue will be to determine whether the terminal layer of Lake Imja's moraine is solid enough to resist such an operation. The water helps to melt the ice faster. At the Lake Imja base camp, Alton Byers meets up with fellow engineer Dean McKinney to conduct research at altitudes over 5,000 meters. Four months. At first glance, the researchers can't believe their eyes. Barely four months have passed since they last visited, and yet large quantities of ice have detached from the glacier, scattering icebergs across the surface of the lake. The lake is at the foot of the Imja, Lhotse Shah, and Ambulapcha glaciers, three giants, all capable of triggering a devastating tidal wave. So behind me, you see the, uh, the mountains with the uh, Imja glacier below them. The glacier is calving off into the lake. And as it does that, then the lake volume increases, which puts additional pressure on the terminal moraine, which given the right tr trigger event, such as an earthquake, could cause a devastating flood downstream, damaging communities and potential loss of life. In Kare, at an altitude of 4,900 meters, Patrick Vagnon's team has had a rough night. Fatigue, and above all, the lack of oxygen, are affecting everyone. There's a difficult day ahead. Patrick wants to carry only what is absolutely necessary. Du coup, on n'a pas assez de porteurs pour tout monter en une fois. Donc là, je sépare un petit peu les charges qui sont essentielles aujourd'hui et puis celles qui arriveront avec une journée ou deux jours de retard. Au total, c'est à peu près une demi-tonne de matériel à emmener là-bas chaque fois qu'on fait une mission où on reste une dizaine ou une quinzaine de jours sur place. A vertical difference of 1,500 meters lies between the climbers and their final objective, a real challenge. But for the scientists, studying glaciers at lower elevations than Mira is not an option. Not only could this glacier soon disappear, but it is also representative of most Himalayan glaciers, which often culminate at altitudes over 6,500 meters. The glacier will go to 5,000 meters altitude, it's the part the highest, up to 6,500. 
Et c'est important de comprendre tout ce qui se passe à différentes altitudes. On fait ça parce qu'il y a des conditions météo qui sont particulières au sommet, qu'on ne sait pas les mesurer et qu'on va essayer de les mesurer. Et ces conditions météo, elles contrôlent l'évolution du glacier dans la partie haute. Et on va pouvoir interpréter le glacier comme un indicateur du climat. The researchers have reached a zone where no human being could possibly survive over an extended period. They are breathing less than 50% of the oxygen they are used to in everyday life. Meanwhile, the IMJO research team has picked up speed. Sonar will be used to precisely measure the depth of the lake and its water volume. The devices are placed on board a Zodiac boat, which was carried here to 5,100 meters by Nepalese porters. We didn't expect this, but we've got about a half inch of ice that we have to break through before we can even paddle. It's going to be 5,000 meters. Okay, you see the icebergs in front of you? Yes. Head to the left of those icebergs. Right. Let's not get too close to the ice, okay? Because it might puncture the raft. Icebergs. <sighs> now all we need is the gin and the tonic. In 2001, another group of scientists estimated the volume of water to be 35 million cubic meters and the deepest point of the lake at 92 meters. 78 meters. 79. 79. 84. 84. It's deeper than people thought. More than 100. More than 100 here. More than 100 meters here. More than 100, wow. Boy, that's the biggest piece of ice I've ever seen break off. Awesome. We're seeing things changing faster here than we've seen anywhere else. This is climate change happening right before our eyes. In barely 10 years, the volume of the lake has gone from 35 million to over 60 million cubic meters. At over a million square meters, its surface is 40 times bigger than it was in 1963. Will it be possible to lower the level of the lake, as was done by the Peruvian engineers? In order to find out, the researchers will perform an ultrasound of the moraine retaining the lake. And now I've reconnected the bottom ones. Red goes to red. So every once in a while, look and see where we are. You got a signal? OK. The scientists think there could be ice hidden deep within the natural barrier. We're trying to map out where that ice is because efforts to lower the level of the lake will need probably to cut a channel through this moraine. And if you encounter ice during the excavation, it could lead to a disastrous flood. Their analysis reveals significant amounts of ice within the moraine, which would make drilling dangerous. Other studies are needed before they can empty the lake without risking accidental and destructive flooding. And here you can see again the level. After five days of hard work, Patrick Vagnon and his team have finally arrived at the Mira Peak base camp at an altitude of 5,400 meters.
The first day at high altitude will be dedicated to collecting data from one of the two weather stations they installed over the past few years. These devices, which record data continuously, are an essential part of the research. C'est un système avec une centrale d'acquisition automatique. Donc toutes les 20 secondes, on a une mesure des diverses variables météorologiques, c'est-à-dire humidité, température à plusieurs niveaux, vitesse de vent, rayonnement solaire, rayonnement infrarouge de l'atmosphère, réfléchi par la surface et hauteur de neige ici. Donc voilà, donc là je note juste la hauteur des appareils et puis j'ai mon ordinateur et je collecte les données. According to some studies, the Himalayan glaciers are retreating on a global level, which would have a significant impact on the availability of water on which these arid areas depend. But this hypothesis cannot be confirmed without high-quality scientific data gathered over extended periods of time. Il y a eu certaines équipes qui ont travaillé dans le passé sur des glaciers beaucoup plus petits euh, qui culminent à 5007, 5008. Et c'est un petit peu dommage parce que ces glaciers qui sont assez bas en altitude, ils sont en déséquilibre avec le climat. Ils sont destinés à disparaître. Alors qu'un glacier comme ça, chaque année, il se régénère. Donc euh, du coup, celui-là, on va pouvoir le suivre sur le long terme. Et puis, il est beaucoup plus représentatif de la majeure partie des glaciers d'Himalaya qui prennent leur source haut en altitude. Glaciers are constantly flowing due to the effect of gravity. The equilibrium line is the limit between the high zone of the glacier where it grows in mass and the lower zone where it loses mass. Ici, on est sur la partie basse du glacier, c'est ce qu'on appelle la zone d'ablation du glacier. C'est-à-dire qu'à cet endroit-là, le glacier il perd plus de masse dans l'année qu'il n'en gagne. Il y a plus de fonte que de neige qui s'accumule. On mesure cette fonte. A hundred meters higher, Christian and Aubery are measuring the glacier's variations in thickness. They have only a few days to survey a very large surface area. They're using a differential GPS, which provides a precise location on the glacier in relation to a fixed point off the glacier's surface. Donc des mesures centimétriques hein, qui sont très précises pour avoir les variations d'épaisseur du glacier suivant différentes sections transversales. Donc sur l'ensemble du glacier, ça nous donne le bilan de masse global du glacier. Et puis d'autre part, on peut calculer des flux de glace et donc comprendre le comportement du glacier, comment il s'écoule et s'il est loin d'un état d'équilibre ou s'il est proche d'un état d'équilibre. Recent assessments of glacier mass have shown that even the glaciers at higher altitudes than the Mira are in danger. Those that fall into Lake Imja are unstable and thinning. To better understand this phenomenon, Alton Byers has decided to continue his research by the lake, this time in winter. He's accompanied by a scientist from the University of Colorado, Boulder. Uliana Horodiscus. So my work is looking at how glacial lakes evolve with time. Uh, and the way I do this is using time-lapse photography. I use things such as solar radiation meters. Uh, I measure water temperatures, air temperatures, all to understand what the physical parameters are governing lake formation and evolution. The scientists begin a hike to the heart of one of the glacier's valleys, alongside Lake Inja's imposing moraine. The path is covered with powdered, eroded rock, also known as glacial flour. This is proof of the power of this ice giant, which melted here long ago. Even in the middle of winter, the Imja glacier is losing mass. Numerous icebergs litter the lake. Up in the accumulation zone there, uh, where you see all that clean ice, that's basically the feeding zone of the glacier. Mm -hmm. And so it's continually feeding even the Imja Glacier now. The problem here is that we have this calving front. 
So even though we might be adding mass from the accumulation zone to this glacier, it's still losing mass because it keeps feeding all this ice into the lake. And you see all these icebergs all around, right? And so right. that mass is leaving and entering into the lake and changing into liquid form now. This accelerated melting can be explained by global warming, but there are also other influencing factors. And then you also have debris thickness that matters. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, on Imja, it's a lot thinner debris. Um, if you have really thin debris cover, you can actually absorb more of that heat, flux that heat to the ice and melt it faster. Another significant cause is the accumulation of melted runoff water on the glacier's surface. This forms small lakes, surrounded by ice that gradually breaks down. You can actually cause calving or collapse of those ice walls. Mm -hmm. And so that way you can really expand your ponds until they start to coalesce into a much larger lake. And so that's what my study is, is to actually understand how quickly that happens. How do I do that? Time-lapse photography. It's a nice visual impact. It can actually show these ice walls collapsing. The researchers have found what seems to be the entrance to a cave and decide to explore it. This means undertaking an expedition over the semi-frozen surface of Lake Imja. It's an ice cave. It's so pretty much. So did you say this was filled with water when you were here in September? Yes, we actually saw a lot of water flowing through this tunnel. Uh -huh. And how we know that is if you look down on the ground here, yeah. you have a lot of fine particles. And so the water deposited this, and yeah. now all we have left is this evidence right in front of us. And so my time-lapse imagery on Umzumpa shows these lake levels going up and down. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really see any evidence of it happening from the surface flow. So we think it must be some kind of connection so the answer I've kind of preliminarily came up with is it's a natural siphon-like process. Something happens further up glacier, or maybe a crack opens, water pours down through one of these tunnels that we're sitting in right here, causes the lake level to rise, puts pressure on that system, it reaches a threshold, and then it's got to release that water. The imaging technique used by David Brashears during his flight over Lake Imja allows him to envisage the possible effects of glacial flooding on the Khumbu Valley. So the concern is, should this lake grow quite large and break a terminal moraine here, that's what we call a GLOF, a glacier lake outburst flood. And it has the potential to run down this valley and threaten the inhabitants, such as here at Dingboche, or further uh, downstream. Will the Kumbu people have to leave their valley someday? Alton Byers knows Dingboche and its residents well. He has befriended them over the past 10 years. He's collaborated on multiple projects, attempting to find possible solutions to the dangers that threaten the villagers living in sight of Lake Imja. Sonam Hishi understands these dangers better than anyone. In 1985, a glacial flood in a neighboring valley carried off his cattle and destroyed his fields, along with his home. No, we don't have no any idea, you know, before we not see for that kind of big flood, you know. And the, the lake is a natural dam that we thought is very strong, very safety. But there's all washed out, you know. Sonam's worries have now turned towards Lake Inja, a mere 10 kilometers from Dingboche. We know that one other day is there should be, the, you know, lake is broke down. And we all afraid. But we not do anything. We don't have power, we don't have money. That way, you know, it's, the, it's all we have to pray for the God. You know? That's all we have to do. 
It is not impossible that Lake Imja's expansion could one day be of use to the people of Dingboche, assuming scientists manage to control the draining of the lake. A small hydroelectric plant built nearby could convert the potential energy of the lake into something that benefits the people. Back on Mirror Peak, at 5,550 meters, after three days of hard work, Christian and Aubery have successfully completed their mission. The challenge was difficult this year due to the particularly strong monsoon, which left a thick layer of snow at high altitudes. Well, we're going to be crevé, and we're marched all the day, until the knee, until the knee, until the knee. Voilà, et bon, mais là, c'est fini. Euh, il nous reste un profil, mais ça sera pour une autre fois. Bah, demain, si j'ai bien compris, on monte à 5008, refaire de nouveaux profils. Donc ça risque de brasser autant, donc euh, ça risque d'être encore difficile. C'était euh, une longue journée. T'es pas dégoûté de la glaciologie <rire> Non, pas encore, mais <rire> ça va bien devenir. <rire> non, ça va, ça va. Ça va. At the Mirror Peak Base Camp, there are barely 18 hours left before the team make their first attempt to reach the summit. Before that, Patrick Vagnon will climb to 5,800 meters to take a core sample. He's hoping to measure the quantity of snow that accumulated on the high part of the glacier during the monsoon. Here we are in the zone of accumulation of the glacier. That is, in fact, the zone of the we are at 5,820 meters d'altitude. Et c'est l'endroit où le glacier se régénère, il accumule de la neige. Et on veut savoir combien il en accumule chaque année en divers sites du glacier. Voilà, donc là j'ai une carotte. Ce qu'on appelle une carotte, c'est juste un cylindre de neige. Et j'ai juste à couper des cylindres parfaits et les peser. Et comme ça, j'aurai la densité. 27, 24 et demi. The size and weight of each core section allows Patrick to determine its equivalent in water. Donc on voit bien qu'au fur et à mesure que la neige s'enfonce, eh elle se tasse et progressivement, elle va finalement, à partir de 20 mètres de profondeur, se transformer en glace. Et c'est ce qui donne la glace du glacier qui en, ensuite va s'écouler le long de la pente jusqu'en bas. Quoi. The glacier's melting, known as ablation, is measured with bamboo sticks taken from the forest 2,000 meters below. It is a physically demanding operation, as it requires using a steam probe that weighs nearly 20 kilograms. By subtracting the ablation values from the accumulation measurements, Patrick and Christian will obtain a key figure that reflects the overall health of the glacier. This allows them to determine whether the glacier's volume has grown or shrunk over the past year. On his end, glaciologist Patrick Ginot is digging through the thick snow layer that accumulated during the monsoon. J'ai creusé un puits et je vais prélever des échantillons de neige tout au long de ce puits pour essayer de caractériser la composition et l'origine de cette chute de neige. Donc le but c'est de rentrer tout le tuyau qu'elle a et donc de mettre à la place le, la balise que j'ai en train de que je suis en train de préparer. Donc quatre segments qui vont rentrer, donc euh, ça va rentrer de 7,50 mètres, mètres à l'intérieur. Donc ici, ça me donne une indication vraiment précise de la fonte qu'il y a à 5,350 mètres d'altitude dans cette zone-là. Au total, on en a une quarantaine de balises disposées à diverses altitudes, diverses orientations. Au 
on est dans un environnement qui nous semble super propre, mais en fait, on a des concentrations de poussière qui sont très élevées et surtout des concentrations de suie, de black carbon, comme on dit, euh, qui se déposent euh, juste avant la mousson et qui auraient un impact sur la fonte du glacier. This snow will be analyzed in a laboratory to determine its chemical composition. Les masses d'air remontent euh, le bassin indien et remontent les vallées himalayennes. Et on a des concentrations qui sont largement supérieures à ce qu'on peut mesurer au centre de Grenoble euh, pendant un pic de pollution, par exemple. L'eau qui, qui est dans le trou, qui est l'eau de fond, qui est de regeler, donc... Euh... Ouais, c'est bon, là. Tu vois, j'ai planté à presque 8 mètres. Donc... Euh... L'année prochaine, je reviens, elle sera certainement sortie de 2 mètres ou 2 mètres 50 et j'aurai ici la quantité de neige et glace qui aura fondu à cet endroit précis. Despite their fatigue, Christian and Aubery have successfully carried out the last day of ice thickness measurements at over 5800 meters. But the hardest part is still to come. Oh, j'en ai marre. Ah ouais, je pense que aujourd'hui ça aurait dû être une journée de repos. Pour moi, ça aurait été bien comme ça. Je, je me suis, je suis pas remis d'hier là. Ce qu'on fait, c'est un peu surhumain. Et puis, eh ben, dans l'équipe, on a un surhomme, mais c'est tout quoi. Donc, c'est pas assez. On n'arrive pas à suivre le surhomme. Mais bon, heureusement qu'il est là. Hein. Sinon, je sais pas ce qu'on ferait. Hein. Moi, oh, je l'ai vu, il est parti avec le carottier, là. Il en avait plein, plein les mains, comme ça. Alors, il a fallu que je lui prenne quelque chose, mais là, je pas le... plus la force. One short night is all that lies between the climbers and their final, most challenging destination, Mira Peak. Donc, euh, je suis un peu inquiet, quand même. Je suis un peu inquiet, oui. Il euh, faut espérer qu'il fasse beau, qu'il n'y ait pas trop de vent, parce que si les conditions sont difficiles au niveau météo, ben je, je crains qu'on ait des difficultés pour euh, arriver à faire ce qu'on veut faire. Quoi. Surtout qu'on a beaucoup de choses à faire hein, à 6004, là. Donc demain, l'objectif, c'est d'aller installer une station météo à gauche du sommet central. On voit bien le sommet central, ça fait un espèce de mamelon. Donc l'idée, c'est de partir à 4 heures du matin depuis le camp de base avec euh, deux Sherpas qui vont porter un petit peu de matériel. On va nous aussi porter du matériel. On a plusieurs choses à faire là-haut. Et puis ça va représenter 5-6 heures de travail à 3 ou 4. Donc euh, le challenge, c'est d'avoir du beau temps et de réaliser tout ça dans la journée puisque sinon on va être obligé de remonter et il y a plus de 1000 mètres de dénivelé pour arriver jusque là-haut avec quand même des charges. At around 8 a.m., the first high altitude Sherpa reaches the summit, followed closely by Patrick Vagnon. and Patrick Gino. An hour later, Christian Vincent courageously arrives. À un moment donné, j'ai cru que je n'y arrivais pas et que je, je, je faisais demi-tour. Hein. J'étais un peu limité. Non, même Patrick a, a souffert un peu, je crois. Donc, euh, bon, enfin, je, je vais prendre acte. Et euh, vu mon grand âge, euh, c'est peut-être des choses qui sont hors de ma portée maintenant. Bah, Aubry, elle arrive, hein, elle n'est pas très loin, Aubry. Et bon, je vais veiller à ce qu'elle n'ait pas froid aux pieds et aux mains, parce que c'est ça le, le plus important, je crois. Il hein. faut faire vraiment attention à ne pas se geler les extrémités. C'est tellement vite fait ici. Bravo. 
Maintenant, il faut travailler. <rire> les glaciers ici, c'est des climatomètres, comme partout dans le monde. C'est-à-dire que si on arrive à comprendre les processus qui contrôlent leur évolution, on comprend mieux le climat ici à cette altitude, on va pouvoir faire des projections sur le futur, en termes de ressources en eau, par exemple. Et là, selon où on se situe dans la chaîne himalayenne, c'est complètement différent. Si on se situe dans la région sud-est, qui est soumise à la mousson, c'est ici, c'est le, le Népal, c'est le Bhoutan, où là, finalement, que les glaciers soient plus petits ou plus gros, en termes de ressources en eau, il y a peu de modifications, il y a peu d'impact, parce qu'en fait, une grande partie de l'eau arrive pendant la mousson. Par contre, dans la partie nord-ouest de la chaîne, vers le Korakoram, vers euh, la, tout le bassin de l'Indus, là, c'est complètement différent, parce qu'en fait, on a souvent des étés qui sont assez secs. Donc du coup, la fonte des glaciers, approvisionne en eau des grandes zones qui sont souvent irriguées. Et il y a des grandes parties des populations qui dépendent de cette eau qui provient des glaciers pour l'agriculture, pour l'eau potable, pour l'hydroélectricité. Donc faire des prévisions sur le futur, d'évolution de ces glaciers, est vraiment important parce que ça a un impact sur les populations. It has taken the team nearly eight hours to assemble the weather station now one of the highest in the world. The data provided by this station will allow scientists to better understand the Himalayan glaciers and will help highlight the impact of global warming here and elsewhere on the planet. According to recent studies, Himalayan glaciers have lost an average of 10 times less mass than what was originally believed in the 1990s. Some of our planet's rooftop has indeed melted, but the amount of ice lost has been largely compensated for by new snowfall and thus new ice. However, the retreat of small glaciers in mid-altitude valleys seems irreversible. In the last 40 or 50 years, there's been tremendous change in the glaciers in this region. Small glaciers have disappeared by the hundreds. Uh, Debris-covered glaciers have lost mass or ablated. Other glaciers have receded and created large and potentially dangerous glacial lakes. So we need to start thinking seriously about this now, how to control these new glacial lakes be before they become large and potentially dangerous. All area is the global warming. Maybe reason for that. Before winter is snowfall. Now the daytime doesn't snowfall. As more heat comes, and the glacier areas all melting faster. Yeah. At an altitude of 4,500 or 5,000 meters, certain villagers notice firsthand that the ice and snow are melting. Yet scientific research draws a more nuanced picture. Il y a eu des rumeurs qui ont circulé il y a une dizaine d'années disant que les glaciers himalayens allaient disparaître. Une monstre rumeur qui était basée sur très peu de données et souvent des données fausses. On s'aperçoit que ces glaciers finalement ils perdent du volume comme tous les glaciers du monde, quasiment tous les glaciers du monde, mais à une vitesse bien moindre par rapport à ce qu'on imaginait. Si on compare à l'ensemble des glaciers de montagne, on s'aperçoit que c'est à peu près deux fois moins rapide que la perte moyenne de tous ces glaciers de montagne. Donc globalement, ils sont quand même en bonne santé. Et pendant longtemps, on va avoir des glaciers ici, surtout qu'ils prennent très souvent leurs sources vachement haut en altitude. On est sur les plus hautes montagnes du monde. Très souvent, les bassins d'accumulation sont à plus de 6000 mètres d'altitude, voire 7000 mètres. Donc c'est même si on a un réchauffement de 5 degrés d'ici 2100, ce qui est envisageable, euh, on va avoir une diminution des glaciers, mais il y en aura toujours au moins pour des siècles. 